Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. Today we have a, a lovely guest. We have um, uh, Dan Eves. Uh, people that remember Dan know how, how much we miss him here. He was definitely one of the coolest guys in uh, Spray. Indeed. Uh, so Dan did his, he was part of the first class, this famous uh, first uh, class that did the PD as an undergrad, and then he worked a bit for Pacific Solar, and then he joined uh, the second gen for, as a PhD. When he finished his PhD, he moved to the state, first for IBM, and now after that to Novolight that now becomes a DuPont. Uh, he's a great guy to speak about everything about solar cells, from the solar cells to the model to the system, but uh, he will uh, give us a small review on DuPont and then a bit on what he's doing now in DuPont. So please welcome Dan. Okay, thanks everybody. Yeah, um, it's been a while since I've, since I've given a little seminar here at UNSW. Um, quite a long time. It is good to see some familiar faces and some new and some old ones. So, uh, nice to meet you all. I'm going to talk today through um, a, quick, a quick introduction into DuPont and the history of DuPont. It's a big old company uh, with a lot of history in material science. Um, then I'm going to talk about the photovoltaics work that is done and some of the products that are out there. And I'm going to go a little more into detail into two, two products and some of the R&D sort of work that gets done at DuPont. So I was going to talk about our metallization pastes, um, which is a big product line. That's something that I work on a great deal. And I'm also going to talk about our holistic module reliability programs. So that's a big part of uh, PV research today and it's a big, big factor in um, looking at material quality. I'm going to talk a little bit about our, um, some advanced encapsulants for modules. So. Um, me, quickly, I know Ziv just gave a quick update, but um, I started here in about 2000, it was, that part of that first class. Some of us are in the room. Um, I was an undergrad, I finished that study. I was working at Pacific Solar for a while as well. I worked out in the cage, out in the back for everybody's safety. I put together systems and tested modules and stuff, um, tested inverters, uh, did my um, second year project work there as well. Um, then I stayed on in the thin film group here uh, working as a lab assistant and then on to do my PhD in thin film silicon. Before moving on, before moving on to the USA, I went and worked at IBM as a postdoc for a couple of years. Uh, IBM used to hold the world record in PV efficiency back in like the 70s when the record cells were in the range of 12 or 13%. IBM did a lot of work back in those days. Um, and they still do, still, still are record holders in a couple of you know, fields of PV devices, but they do all kinds of stuff there. Nano wires, um, fin FETs, phase chase memory, a lot of semiconductor device stuff, and that still continues. It's the same building where they have the Watson supercomputer. They do a lot of software there. Um, so big company, not a PV company, but does a lot of PV work just like DuPont does. Then I worked as a startup, worked in a startup company uh, called Selexos working on thin film solar cells, but that was a fairly short stint before I joined Inovalight. I started working with Malcolm, uh, a couple of other alumni were there before we got acquired by DuPont, and that's my current, current spot now, is DuPont, that's been about five years. <coughs> so that site is now called the DuPont Silicon Valley Technology Center. We've got our solar cell pilot line there and a module fab as well. Uh, you can see in the, you see at the top here, We've got our um, like Bacini screen printing line. We've got some wet edge tools. We've got diffusion furnace tucked into the back there. We have a full pilot line for making industrial type cells, all six inch, um, six inch standard solar cells we work on. And then we have our module lab as well. So we've got laminators and all the things for making modules. We've got Tabber Stringer, uh, IV testers, EL testers, and we have uh, advanced um, uh, accelerated aging chambers as well. So we can do all module reliability testing as well. So we go from uh, the cell from the wafer all the way through into the modules and look at the materials and the processing that we do and how they interact to change uh, efficiency and power output from cells and modules, but also the reliability and the long-term stability of those, those products that we develop. And overall, uh, that's, that's the message for DuPont, right? DuPont is a science company. DuPont does a lot of fundamental chemistry and material science and the idea is to build new products that deliver the needs of, of industry, market driven, innovative solutions to the world's biggest challenges. Right? And there's several thrusts actually that need a lot of work. It's constantly ongoing and developing um, many, many places where DuPont needs to provide chemicals for industry and for, 
for, uh, for um, advanced products. So if you look at across this 200 year time span, all right, it's a diverse product set has been developed by DuPont over time. Um, photovoltaics is relatively new, like last 30 years. Uh, but if you go all the way back to the start, it was explosives and gunpowders. Um, and through that first 100 years, they developed from, from gunpowders into dynamite. Uh, and a strong safety culture came at DuPont. <laughs> Due to that, there was, uh, they talked about you know, losing, losing workers and losing horses to explosions. Um, so they started working in buildings that had three walls only, so that if there was an explosion, it could just blow out. So you work in open air labs back in those days. So that strong safety culture has been maintained all the way through into modern day. Um, about 100 years after that start, there was the experimental station was started in Wilmington, Delaware. Uh, that's the main science labs. They still are DuPont's headquarter science labs. And that was when they started working on dyes and plastics and started to work in more advanced materials outside of the space of explosives. Um, and you can read all of these different products that have come since then. A lot of them are very well known. You've got cellophane. Uh, nylon, you know, still very commonly used today. Um, mylar, another one for your overhead projectors. You've got Kevlar for bulletproof vests, still 60 years later, a big product line for DuPont. Hard to make, hard to develop, and, and nobody, else can, nobody else has been able to copy that as of yet. So still very popular, Kevlar. You've got Lycra and Tedlar. Tedlar is used for back sheets in modules, all right, 30 plus years now. It's already been in the field. You've got Tyvek and, and Nomex, these are like um, building construction materials, so fireproof like uh, sheets, fireproof and waterproof sheets that are under roofing materials and on walls, it's ubiquitous all over the world. Um, and in the, modern era, in the modern era, I'd say we started to look at um, what they call the integrated science, all right, joining material science, joining biotech, looking at lots of different things. So acquisitions of companies like Pioneer and Soleil and um, Denisco looking at um, agriculture and looking at enzymes, looking at um, crop protection, different chemicals for food yield, for processing of soy proteins, all kinds of things get done at DuPont these days. All right? So that's where we are today um, with a lot of biotech coming in. Um, and, but still a strong focus on our advanced materials. These are the three core core strengths for DuPont. So that agriculture is about feeding people, um, feeding people with, with quality foods and food processing, food processing technology, food packaging, all of these things come in. The bio-based industries, the enzymes and other kind of biotech and biomedical stuff. And then the advanced materials, which is PV, as well as you know, a range of other materials that get used for lots of different, lots of different, um, uh, lots of different applications. So if we want to think about that advanced material suite and focus solely on the solar module, you can see that you break a module out, you've got a whole range of, range of pieces there and DuPont has products that are, that, are, that are everywhere there. So you could start at the frame and the junction box with some sort of uh, uh, composites, and polymer materials for strength, rigidity or lightweight materials, um, encapsulant layers like the EVA or some advanced ones like the ionomers that, that we have. Um, DuPont doesn't do glass, but has glass replacement materials as well, which could be going go to flexible solar cells or flexible substrates. And then you've got the cell level stuff, which is the metallization paste, which I'm going to talk about. Um, there's also the, 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 the doping inks, which I spoke about at the New Orleans conference uh, for N and P type doping on, on solar cells as well. But really it's the metallization pastes and the, uh, and the encapsulant materials is what I'm going to be talking about mostly today. Although there is stuff on, you can find all of this uh, on the web if you're interested in any of these individual things. So that's the basic product suite, okay? The biggest name materials that we have is our solar met, driving price and or driving efficiency for customers, driving up efficiency of solar cells. We've got the Tedlar back sheet has a long proven, um, long proven field uh, field testing for reliability across 30 years, 30 years plus, um, pre preventing corrosion, preventing insulation failures or anything like that on, on solar modules. Then we've got the encapsulants, the, the standard kind of, we've got LVAX or the kind of, st sort of standard EVA materials that we sell to the industry um, and the more advanced ionomer encapsulants, which I'm going to talk about. And then once again, these composites that are used for mounting brackets for frame replacement for lightweight modules. Um, and thinking about all these products, you know, we have to keep pushing 
pushing three main factors to make PV systems better and make the rollout, you know, make industry succeed. The, uh, the first one's efficiency. We have to improve the efficiency of cells and modules by improving materials. We have to do it with cost that's the same or better, um, better materials, better processing, better yields, or work on lifetime, you know. We need lifetime to be long and reliable power supply for years and years of, of a system in the field. And we really need to, if we push any one of these, it can't be really at the expense of the other. So the systems have to keep getting better and cheaper and more reliable over time. And that's how, that's how PV is going to grow into the future. But let me talk now about, about our metallization pastes. Okay, our solar met metallization pastes have been around for probably about um, 10 or 15 years. It's been a big success story for, for DuPont. Um, big collaborative effort too. We work across labs in the east coast of the USA, my California lab, the Silicon Valley Technology Center. Um, we've got sites in China and sites in Taiwan, all have their own R&D capabilities, all with their own specializations working on different things, especially our, our, our sites in, in um, Singapore and China and Taiwan work very closely with customers. So a lot of quick prototyping and testing in the field so looking at that evolution, just um, going back just, just a few years, really, our Solomet, our Solomet uh, product line, you've got cells were rarely above 18% just a few years ago. And um, we had our, our 15X and 16X sort of pace were out there in the field being used. And then it was the actually the 17X product series that came in at late 2010 that really lifted really lifted efficiency for all solar manufacturers. What well, was the case before, contact resistance was rarely, um, wasn't very good back in these days, or it was okay, but the, the silicon had to be doped very, very heavily in order to get an ohmic contact, all right? So what this paste did, this 17X series, had excellent contact resistance that allowed people to lighten up the emitters, go to lower doping at the surface and still have a good contact. That lower doping comes with emitter lifetime improvements and blue response improvements. And you saw, you know, a, a half a point or a full point of efficiency, efficiency improvement across, uh, across all the different factories around the world. That was a big bump. And I don't think we'll see such a big jump again from a single product improvement. It's going to require more innovation around the architecture and stuff. But you can see there's been a continuous improvement as new products have gone forward. Solar cell makers have gotten more sophisticated. Uh, and the products are also getting better. Okay, so... Some of these improvements come from using an extra bus bar or relatively simple things using going from small wafers to big wafers as well. Um, but across that couple of years, right, there was the 18X series, which was an improvement. But where we are right now is 19X, still continuously improving. And that's, that's pushing now to, towards very fine line printing, um, less shading, you know, better grid designs in general with fine line printing. And we're going to keep pushing keep pushing this, okay? We've got fairly light emitters today, not too much more to gain from that, but the, actually the, the fine line printing is where you're gonna get the most bang for the buck, both for a customer's um, cell performance, but also for, for lay down and cost as well. Like people are gonna start using less metal paste and solar cells are still gonna keep getting better and yet cheaper. So looking at that, say 19X, something product came out last year, We'll work closely with a collaborator, like a customer. They'll run a few thousand cells for us and test our products. You know, we've done internal testing, but we're only making a couple of hundred cells a day in our lab. So um, you want to see how, the, how it performs in the line, you've got to get it out there and get it in the customer's hands. So customer will run a few thousand cells and give us a distribution like this. Tell us how, how we did and what they think of the product, give you some feedback. And you can either go back to the drawing board or you can lock it in as a success. So what you can see here is a nice, uh, nice efficiency gain, the whole distribution's moved over a little bit. Um, good processing, good print quality, gets your yield good, narrows that distribution somewhat, and it also can eliminate this low-end efficiency tail here, like these cells that are sub 17.8% or something like that. If you can eliminate those, you've got to sell those cells relatively cheaply, so you want to cut those off, move the whole distribution up and tighten everything up. So overall, a good success, right? You work with your customer, you, you test your products, you roll them out there, and this is exactly what we hope to deliver. Point one, you deliver it a few months later if you can do it again, a point oh five, a point one, a point one five, keep building, keep pushing year on year. We want to keep sliding up as we, as we develop new paste systems. Um, the same thing's true for PERC. We have not just multi, right? That was a multi, about 18% efficiency distribution. 
What we've got is also working closely with partners. They tell us, we've got perk cells, they want to fire colder. They want colder firing because it gives a better, better back, better BSF at the back, less voids. There's a lot of, um, there's like a narrower processing window with perk cells a little bit. They say they want to go colder. So we developed the 76 series for the front side of perk cells that enables cold firing. So try to, inter try to tailor the front of the cell, try to tailor that front product to make the rear better. All right. And what we see is the new product, factor of 10 improvement in contact resistance for various firing temperatures, okay? And this contact resistance is okay. It's normalized here, all right? But uh, factor of five to 10 improvement in contact resistance with the new paste. And the old paste would fall off as you fired it colder. The new paste holds this flatter profile. So you can fire it cold and maintain a high fill factor. You've still got your contact resistance. The backside's better. It's a synergy of like one plus one equals three, you know? So you end up pushing efficiency of perk cells up again, you know? Another 0.15. So this is something we did with TSEC, a company we partner with closely, although we have many partners that we work with. So you, you, you develop pro products like this, work closely with them, test, go back to the drawing board, test again. Um, and, and this is a good success story, you know? Perk cells pushed up over 21% in, in TSEC's manufacturing line. They've got now their higher, higher power modules. This uh, 60 or 72 cell modules at 300 or 360 watt modules, so high power, um, high value modules, maybe getting sold into, into uh, higher end markets like uh, Japan, other places that, that pay a bit of a premium for high power modules. So um, good success story. Our products helping TSEC and TSEC using our products, cell engineering and product development going together. Um, so yeah, good story. But on top of all of them, right, you've got all of these, but the, the future looking forward is towards fine line printing, really. That's where we're going to go. It lifts all, all platforms can benefit from fine line printing, and we're going to keep pushing on this boundary here. So it was not so long ago that lines were printed at 100 microns or 80 microns, screen printed lines. Today, most manufacturers are below 40 or at 40 microns on the screen opening, and we're gonna keep pushing that. We do our R&D in this range down here at 30 microns, and we're gonna keep pushing this, this line width down. It, it hasn't hit the end yet, it's still, uh, it's still approaching maybe 20 microns. We're not sure where it's going to end exactly, but um, it's gonna keep improving over time. And actually, these line widths here, these were the line widths I thought were only possible by a laser when I was a PhD student here. We're never gonna get screen printing to this level, but it's there now and it keep, keeps, keeps shrinking year on year. So um, 35 microns, we can do that today. And a lot of what I do these days is work on screen printed metallization, work on paste, work on fine line printing. And this is where we're gonna keep, keep trying to push this. And there's a lot of advantages for fine line. You know, you, fine line is less shading, fine lines, less contact area and less voltage loss. If you want to look at that, although that's a small part, but you can start pack lines closer together and then you have less sheet resistance losses in the emitter. There's a lot of things that come. You start, start uh, add, adding these up together as you go to very fine lines for the, for the metal on the front. Um, but, it's, but it's not easy to get there. We're going to be working along thinking of this sort of uh, interaction of screen technology and our paste technology and the printing process and the cell engineering and the pattern design and stuff. All of these things are gonna to have to come together to keep adding additive efficiencies, 0.05s and 0.1s, we'll keep pushing forward and we're gonna, we're gonna keep lifting efficiencies of all solar cell architectures purely just through, through the fine line printing. We wanna move from something like this, wide and relatively low to narrower and taller with improved aspect ratios. And we're gonna to have to keep stretching this narrower and narrower and taller and taller and continuously get improvement. But you look at the screen opening. So this is a picture of a, of a screen looking from the bottom there. So you can see an emulsion and some mesh. This is getting very crowded in here. Lots of mesh wires, hard for paste to flow through and around these gaps and, and print a nice quality finger. So we're looking at new screen designs, new mesh designs, and then looking at the printing process using industrial screen printers, seeing what we can, what we can get with just screen printing. There's a lot of other things you could do. You, know, you could work on double printing. You could work on a dual print uh, system with a stencil for a finger. There's a lot of other things to do, but screen printing still has a lot of legs left, we think, and we're gonna keep, we're gonna keep focusing on that for now. For several years, it's gonna be the focus. So 
I mentioned the metal induced recombination a, a second ago or the, or, the, or the voltage losses. So I wanted to, beyond just the, the, the roadmap of improving finger widths, which improves, improves everything, I wanted to, wanted to delve a little bit into something that I, um, something that I presented in New Orleans last year, uh, um, looking at metal induced recombination losses from screen printed metal. Um, there's all these different voltage losses that, that come into play uh, with a normal solar cell, you've got, you've got uh, an emitter recombination loss, a BSF, uh, and this could be different for perk or whatever, but it doesn't really matter in this case. Um, a bulk recombination loss, and then you've got the metal, right? You've got this metal loss because you don't have a passivation here. You've got metal sitting on bare silicon or maybe even worse than that. You've got um, like crystallites or something, who knows? But you've got a lot of metal induced recombination that you can, you can lose on a cell. And, um, we, we measure this by looking at a, a test structure wafer like this, a six inch wafer that's got all this different kind of metal coverage on it. You can see this, uh, this PL image shows how the, the, the luminescence changes across the surface. You change the metal area, you change the amount of light that gets into the cell so the voltage is less. But you're also adding more metal, so you're getting less voltage as well, you're getting a lower carrier density in the base. You're also got, uh, the luminescence also just doesn't get out because of those fingers on the front. So we measure this, all right? We measure the, the, the line widths to know the shading. We measure uh, structures like this with a Sun's VOC tester to look at the voltage. And from that, you can pull out the, the J0 of the diodes and kind of get an idea of what's the trend of J0 versus the metal contact area and pull out your, your metal recombination level, all right? In this case, uh, it's about, uh, about 1,000 femtometers per square centimeter is about a standard kind of number you'll commonly see for, for metal on a, on a screen printed metal on a diffused emitter, all right? And the reason we use a test structure like this, you can't use a normal solar cell for measuring metal induced recombination. It, it doesn't work. Um, bus bars have different size to fingers and you have optics and recombination things that go on. You also have little handling marks around the edge of wafers that are almost impossible to get rid of. And you've got edge recombination too. So you have all these non-idealities that can come into play. So better to use a test structure and extract this and have a hard number for your J0. If you want to make models, where are we going to go with solar cells? How good's J0 going to get? How good can voltage even be? Is something you don't really know unless you know the, the hard inputs. So what I wanted to look into was, was something about, I'm going to just go, run into one brief study, shallow emitters, all right? There's a lot of advantage towards a shallow, shallow emitter on a normal cell. You've got, um, you know, shallow and lightly doped generally means better voltage and less recombination in the emitter. Shallower is more light that gets through the emitter and into the base. Um, better blue response you'll get. Um, but there's a risk though, all right? There's a risk that that, um, that emitter can get damaged or metal or crystallites or something can, can cause some damage there, some voltage losses, some recombination mechanisms. That's exactly what we see, all right? We print bigger fingers, wider fingers and put more metal down we lose our voltage on our standard cell, our 90 ohm per square emitter, all right? And this is pretty standard emitter for multi in industry today on a multi-crystal emitter, about 90 is where most people sit. Um, the upper range would be 110, we see the same thing, 110 ohm per square emitters, we once again see voltage loss. Uh, but as you go to a very light emitter, you have a very severe voltage loss down to below 600 millivolts, you can see there. So We've hit like a threshold there where the shallow emitter is now so shallow or the emitter is so high performance that now it suffers from, uh, suffers from metal problems. And it's not just purely in voltage. You can see that the, the pseudo fill factor, just the purely fill factor, pure fill factor as limited by the recombination is roughly flat for the first couple of emitters, but we start to take a big hit. We do screen printing on a shallow emitter. We're going to lose five points of fill factor not because the contact's not good enough, but because the recombination has problems, all right? We have, we have non-ideal recombination going on in our cell now, and it's due to the, it looks like it's due to the metal. So that's very easy to characterize if you wanted to look at a non-ideality. You look at a two-diode model and you, you sum it up as a J02 to try and get a simple metric to look at it. I know a lot of us have looked at them before. Um, so yeah, the normal two-diode model we, we, we're familiar with. Um, and you can see that if we, if we do this same plot of metal recombination against the contact area, you can see you've got um, shallow emit, uh, a standard emitter at about 90 ohms per square. We've got a relatively flat line here, this blue line. As we go lighter, we've got a steeper trend, so more J0 as we, add, as we go lighter, and then even more again do we get to one, 130 ohm per square, very light and shallow emitters, um, with, the, with the increasing J0 that, that comes with that, almost a doubling of that as we go lighter. 
But the big one is actually the, the n equals 2 component. You can see this is clearly due to the metal, this n equals 2 component. You can always find an n equals 2 problem with a cell or some non-ideality, but unless you make different contact areas and try and attribute it directly to the metal, you can't tell for sure. But what we can see is on a shallow emitter, you might expect 500 nanoamps per centimeter of contact area. It's quite, it's quite a lot. You know, you can't, can't get away with that. You're going to see a fill factor hit just from this, <coughs> a fill factor and a voltage hit just from this on a shallow emitter. So part of what we're going to try and do is we're going to keep pushing this as, li as, as lines get narrower, people are going to go to higher efficiency and higher sheet row and pack more fingers onto a cell and then this problem is going to come. Then we're going to have to solve that problem and we're going to have to keep moving, keep improving over time. But thinking about just that first, the n equals 1, the standard one, the n equals 2 is a complicated thing to think about and, and model. But um, based on Mal's work from a recent conference, I looked at the idea of um, <coughs> emitter etching. All right, So I've assessed the, the metal induced recombination on a few different a few different emitters here, okay? So we've got a acid etched or like an iso textured, multi sort of textured wafer. And then you've got your standard pyramid texture on, on mono, all right? Um, you've got your kind of normal multi diffusion or a very shallow one with this enhanced recombination, a thousand to 5,000 femtoamps, like really high recombination depending on which paste you choose. Um, the standard emitter is kind of lower for multi and for mono it's even lower yet again, all right? And you can notice the ranking is the same by paste. You know, paste A and B are always the worst, and B, uh, C is kind of intermediate, and D is the newest sort of paste we've got with the lowest recombination rate. Um, but the ranking of them all being the same as each other uh, indicates it's pretty consistent and pretty paste dependent. You know, that J naught that you've got. So you can model you can model emitter recombination using Edna. I got this off PV Lighthouse, um, and you can think that. If you were to put metal directly on the surface, you'd be contacting something doped about, let's say, 5e20 or something like that, and the, the depth is about 500 nanometers. But if you were to etch the surface away, you could etch, say, 100 nanometers, and you'd be contacting now a lower doped surface, and that metal would be closer to the PN junction. Like, what are you expecting to happen from that? Um, so if you, if you plot that J0, you'd expect from the, from the metal etching uh, idea, you could see that we measure J0 range, say 400 to 900 femtoamps or something like that. If this etching model's right, you'd say, you'd say that our metal's firing through the nitride, etching the 80 nanometers of nitride and then hitting us about 20 or 40 nanometers of silicon. It's not a lot of over etching. They're both silicon based materials, so we're etching both. Um, so we are etching emitters a little bit is what it looks like. But if you wanted to project where are we gonna go this number of like 200 is probably about the limit. We're not going to get better than that. If you remove the nitride and you don't etch this, if you don't etch any silicon at all, that's the best paste we can hope for. And our best paste is already, you know, down here at 400. How much more voltage are you going to get if you get a 200? It's not a lot. There's not a lot there to be had. Um, so we're very good. We have we have room to improve, and we will we'll continue to push this. Voltage is still going to get better over time, but um, the way cells are today the voltage losses aren't primarily on the front due to the front side silver anyway. Um, they're mostly from the bulk and from the backside where most of it is, but things like perk cells with high voltages, or if we start to talk about things like um, N cells, N type wafers with, or IBC cells, the screen printed metal starts to play a bigger role as cell voltages go up to 670, 680, you start to really push voltages up and the metal's gonna get more important over time. Um, so yeah. So yeah, we're working on fine line printing, working on metal recombination. We work on all of these different things, cell architectures. We, we, we try and push everything and work out where we're gonna go in the future, how much entitlement is there, how, how far can we lift efficiencies with our product development and how much can we add to industry? What are we gonna give? So that's it for metallization, all right? It was, uh, I saw a few yawns. Um, that's, it for, that's it for metal induced recombination anyway, all right? I'm gonna talk now about, um, you know, probably interest some of you, but not all. I'm going to talk about our holistic cell and module reliability now, okay? So um, DuPont has a whole suite of products, right? Whole suite of products, and many of them are for module packaging. And they go out in the field and they've got to survive 25, 30 years. You know, it's a long time to sit out in the open, in the rain, in the hail. Um, so what we've got is uh, trying to develop a big picture of how reliability works and how the interactions between different products in the module or the exposure in different 
different uh, different regions could play a role, how humidity and how a product selection and the bill of materials especially, how that changes cell reliability and module reliability in the field, okay? So we've got a whole analytical lab at DuPont. It's like the electron microscope unit plus maybe double that. We have uh, XPS experts, Raman experts, they're like interior, internal consultants that we use to um, look, at the, look at the science and look at the mechanisms underlying all the degradation modes that we observe. And we work out how we can address that by changing our materials, changing, changing the way we process our materials. And the idea is to eventually get to the point where we have optimum reliability and, uh, and, and the best durability across the lifetime. We can keep developing better products, okay? So that includes the metallization paste, it includes our back sheets, it includes our en encapsulants as well. And <clears throat> across the whole length of DuPont, there's been a lot of work in all sorts of fields looking at reliability. Um, there's the military component, military, de demand, military and automotive demand very high um, standards in reliability. Something like your cell phone, uh, shorter time frame, you know, it's gone in several years. But something like these kind of applications, you need very long lifetimes, like PV. You need electronic materials that can last um, many years. No, not much pushes as much as PV at, at 25 years, except maybe something that goes into like a satellite and goes into orbit. But DuPont's done a lot of this work over the years, and we've had 30 years working on PV reliability. So we, we, we're going to keep pushing this. We've got a good... Um, We've got a good background for those kinds of studies. Um, and uh, as part of that, we've got our fielded module program. So we go into the field, get access to solar plants, and go and walk around on rooftops or in power plants that are installed in deserts. Um, all continents, all cell manufacturers that both use our products or use com competing products, if we can work it out. Sometimes you can't even tell. Um, you know, you're talking about 45 module manufacturers. There aren't that many now, but you've got um, across a 30, 30 year installation, you know, history. You've got lots of modules with varying quality that have been out in the field, and it's it's just visually you can see defects often on on a panel, right? This doesn't even look at power. This just looks at visual defects. So about half of the modules look fine. Everything else has some sort of a problem with it that you can see with your eye, all right? If you just go and have a look, and some of them are in the encapsulant. You can imagine yellowing or something like that, or, or some bubbles or something else forming, some kind of visual problem with the, with the encapsulant. But you've also got the, the back sheets can be cracked or yellowed or have other kind of issues or, or stretching. Um, but a lot of what you see is in the cell, like the cell looks funny or the cell has fingers that are, that are, that are off or the cell has some sort of problems or cracks. Uh, the cell's the big one if you wanted to look at um, like what fails visually or aesthetically in the field. Um, and then there's uh, these other things, you know, like glass pitting and etching and stuff like that. But this, this kind of number approaching 50%, it's 41% it says here, um, is very consistent with what BP and SunPower show for, uh, in, in their studies that they've done over the years. So most of us are coming to the same conclusion here. There's a lot of problems in the field, at least visually, we can all monitor the power very easily, but uh, these kind of um, um, these kind of issues crop up when you do when you do visual inspection. That's getting more important as as time goes on as well. So, <clears throat> as far as as far as that, we can address we can address this uh, cell issue, at least one of the cell appearance issues, through improving the encapsulation. All right, and what we've got is a an ionomer encapsulant. It's a new type of new type of encapsulant. It's not your standard EVA ethyl vinyl acetate. It's this uh, new, new sheet you can use to replace that that will provide a lot of benefits. So it, it improves the aesthetics through improving snail trails. I don't know who knows about snail trails. Relatively new phenomenon. If you don't know about snail trails, I'll show you. Uh, snail trails are happening and it's a new phenomenon that's, that's, that's surprising. Um, and we've also got potential induced degradation is another mode of failure in the field that's coming on over time. So I'm going to talk about our, our ionomers. Um, you can maybe learn a little about that. So this is a snail trail, all right? You have these dark lines forming over the surface of a cell. And it can happen in the first year that it's in the field. The modules are still under warranty. The, the power hasn't degraded, but these lines are cropping up and people are getting nervous. Like, what, what is this? What are these lines coming up? These are failing. I want new modules. 
I don't like it. And it's understandable, right? It doesn't, doesn't, look, very, doesn't look very good. You know, and I can say, well, if the power plant's still performing fine, who cares? But that's what, that's what an engineer would say, right? Uh, this aesthetic thing is, is a problem in the field. And if you use an, if you use an ionomer, uh, you don't get this, right? This looks nice, right? So DuPont's product's good, <laughs> all right? You don't get this effect. You don't see these snail trails anymore. But like, what's going on exactly? Um, so these lines, you only started to see these snail trails coming out, these visual defects coming up in the last 10 years. And it's not something anybody saw in an accelerated aging test. So we're going to introduce new module materials or a new encapsulant or a new metal. Right? We're going to run it through our test cycles. We're going to stick it at 85 degrees for hundreds of hours. We're going to measure the module, see what happened. The materials perform fine in our standard testing, the standard test protocols that all modules have to go through. And it's months of testing. You want to make a new material or a new, new solar module, it goes through months of testing before you can install that thing, before you can qualify it. Um, but these lines started cropping up in 2007. It's not something anybody saw in the testing, but it only occurs in the field. So fielded testing is not necessarily the same as the accelerated aging testing. You've got to keep an eye on what's going on in the field to see what's going on. Um, and it's, it's increased dramatically over, the, over recent years. So what's happened, not certain. No one knows for sure what's happened, but the bill of materials has changed a lot. Metal pastes have moved, advanced rapidly in this kind of time frame, but so have encapsulants, got more transparent, cross-linking differently, different additives for doing different jobs. Um, back sheets are also changing, except for, except for the Tedla kind of thing that, that DuPont uses. Um, and what's worked out is that it's right, it's right on top of micro cracks. So there are actually cracks in the cell. These things are highlighting cracks in the cell that aren't a problem for efficiency, but it's at the position of a micro crack in the cell. Um, and it's across most, most, most module manufacturers and most, uh, most installations. So what's going on there with that, with, that, with that visual defect, that snail trail that you see? So we can dig in and have a look at this and try and get at what the fundamental mechanism is of this degradation. And you can separate, this is hard to do, separating the EVA off the front of a solar cell, all right? This is hard to do, but it, but it can be done. So you can pull off this EVA and you can have a look at the cell without the EVA and you can have a look at the EVA itself in the SEM and you can see, maybe it's hard to see, but there's lots of little, little precipitates and little particles that are, that are formed there. Are they from the silver or what are they? Who knows, you've got this discoloration that's happened. But if you look at a cross section, you can see it much more clearly. You can see that we're starting to get little, little balls of silver, little nanoparticles of silver are forming inside the EVA. So there's like, uh, electro migrating out or it's etching and re-precipitating out. It looks a lot like, a, like what you'd want out of a surface plasmon or something, right? It's scattering light, it's changing the optics at the surface, but it doesn't really, doesn't matter for, for the cell efficiency so much, but it's certainly an optical defect that this is happening. And like, what's going on exactly? We're not sure what's changed over the years, but it's certainly a, a silver and EVA interaction, that chemistry, there's something going on here that, that's causing this to look like this. And that's proven with the XPS and the Raman and the other, other anal analytical techniques that the chemists at DuPont use. So we know that's what it is. So that's certainly what's happening. What we think it is, the model we've proposed, and it seems to be pretty solid, is that you've got, um, you've got a micro crack in a cell and you can see it in the EL. We take our modules and we crack them on purpose and you can see that you end up with a crack like this. And then after, after aging, you see that the, the dark lines are forming in exactly these places. It's what, what we expected to see. And the, 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 the mode is that you have the EVA after being exposed to, to UV and temperature and moisture, all of these together. So you can form it in an accelerated test if you want, but just in the field, this is happening at the 50 or 60 degrees out in the UV in the field for, for a year or so. Um, we're forming acetic acid inside the EVL, reforming acetic acid. Um, and that's creating like a corrosion or an etch, a silver etch that's then creating the snail trail. That's the mechanism that's going on. You can see, you can look at a couple of different manufacturers of EVA, you'll get different formation times. Um, we fabricated our own EVA that had a touch extra acetic acid in it just to see if it would happen and we can get it down to two weeks. So it's the acetic acid's the driver, all right? The acetic acid's the driver. Um, but an ionomer 
doesn't have this structure. It does not have the acetate. It doesn't have the chemical in it. So you use an ionomer, you get around the whole problem. And you think about it, um, if, it's a, if it's a crack, you can control that with quality module manufacturing, but you can't tell the installer not to walk on the module or you can't control the way it's shipped. Sometimes these cells are going to get cracked and you can't help it. So you want your module to last. Uh, you have to try and address these fundamental degradation modes to, to have a look at it. And the reason why it happens at a crack is basically that um, you know, a module is sealed, but it's not fully sealed. The back sheets all have some sort of moisture vapor transport, so water gets in. Um, mostly at the back of the solar cell, you can get like a little bit of corrosion, a little bit of uh, moisture or oxygen can get in there. And it can move through the EVA, and this back sheet of EVA, this can be saturated in a day with water, and then it's done. It's out in the field, it saturates after one day, and, and you're finished with that. But um, the front sheet doesn't get that the same way, unless you would uh, unless water could creep in around the edges and then come in, you know, 100 millimeters or whatever into the center of the wafer. So that would be a very slow process. But if you've got a micro crack in a cell, you can push water through this like uh, hundreds of times faster and end up saturating the front, which is why you can then have the moisture localized here. Then the UV can act on the moisture, form the acetic acid, and form the snail trail that the customer doesn't like. So that's the mechanism behind, behind snail trail formation. It's one of the things that DuPont works on, and it's a product, we've developed a product that gets around it. But avoiding cracks is a very hard thing for a manufacturer to do because it's not always in your own hands. You know? If you see a crack, you can reject that module, but the crack doesn't necessarily hurt efficiency. So you don't really want to throw out the module, like it's fine. But if you're going to get a snail trail, they're going to send it back to you. You, you, know, you, you, want, to, you want to get around that whole, whole question, you know? So we've got, we've got something that can, that can address that issue. But there's a second thing, all right? Ionomers also stop potential induced degradation, and this is actually why they were invented. Um, potential induced degradation, if you hold a module out at bias in the field for a long time, there's sodium ions from the glass that are driven into the, the silicon. They accumulate at the surface of the silicon and form shunts in the cells and you gradually lose your fill factor and your voltage and you'll end up with some very poor looking modules like this if you expose them the wrong way or, or, uh, or hook them up the wrong way. So what you've got is the, the, the cells degrade starting at the frame and then the cells near the edges fail until you've done say 100 hours of testing. You've got a standard EVA, all these edge cells are sort of, sort of dead here and you've killed cells in every string in the module and, and, and you've lost, say, half your power, 40% of your solar power has been degraded from, the, from this uh, standard EVA. There's PID resistant EVAs that can attenuate it somewhat, but it's still not perfect. Look, uh, you've still lost some, some power around the edges. You've lost some of your edge cells and that's, that's given you a, about a 10 or 20% efficiency uh, loss or power loss out of the module. Whereas an ionomer doesn't, doesn't allow sodium diffusion so if it doesn't allow sodium diffusion, the sodium can't get to the cell and it can't cause, it can't cause the PID. So there's like a double, double benefit from that, that material there. So that's, this is a study that we did with Ying Li. Um, that was presented, what, 2014? We presented this. So working closely with customers, they want to get around this thing, especially if they want to go to even higher voltages, like 1500 volts or 2000 volts. If you want that at the end of your string, like that's, large voltage is going to drive a lot of sodium migration and a lot of potential induced degradation. You have to get around it with, uh, you can get around it with module materials, better materials. You can, you can try and address it with shorter strings or hooking up, your, uh, hooking up your, your system differently. But mostly we want to see this. We want to see good cells over time that aren't resistant to, to the degradation and they're still hanging in there after hundreds of hours of high voltage, high bias, high humidity. Um, that's what we want to see. So, um, so that's yet another material that, that DuPont's made to try and try and lift the game across the industry, improve reliability and improve performance. So thinking of that reliability message, all right, we've got uh, so panels have been out there. The first grid connected system in Europe uses DuPont products, uses a DuPont back sheet. The cells and modules look different back then, but the same basic structure and this system's still doing well with Tedlar on the back. Good reliable, uh, good, reliable material. And even big system, one megawatt system in Sacramento, only about an hour and a half from, from my office. That's been installed and going over 30 years as well. 
uh, performing performing well, and that also includes our, our solar met metallization pace going back that far. So quality materials, they can make a good difference to the performance of your uh, system across the long run. And it all goes back to the fundamental science and engineering that we put in. So, so that's all I had for you today. So materials matter is the message, all right? We've got, it's important to pick the right materials for durability and efficiency. We spoke a bit about the metallization losses, fine line printing, our good perk pastes. We're gonna keep addressing these other architectures as well. And then we've got uh, our, our encapsulants for snail trails and PID resistance, um, another important factor to, to keep going. We've got a lot of other materials, Tedla, a lot of frames, a lot of other things that we continue to work on as well. So um, that's all I have for today. <laughs> Any questions? difference with the Ionoma? Ionoma is, Ionoma is more expensive, but EVA films are usually quite thick. So what the way we are marketing it is a thick EVA film with a thin Ionoma sandwiched onto it. So it's then the material is there to do all the work the material is supposed to do for addressing the, the, the negative things, but the EVA and the bulk of the film you're going to use is relatively cheap. So um, if that's, that's the idea. It's more expensive, but there's workarounds that we can do for that. Richard? Uh, Daniel, thanks very much and welcome back. Um, Thank you. The, the, another issue with encapsulants that's been very prominent in recent years has been the transparency to blue-violet light. Mm. And yep. I, I guess if you're selling it with, e with most of the thicknesses EVA on your sandwich, then it's still going to be an issue. But the, the Ionoma itself, how is its transparency? Better than EVA, it's more transparent. But the fact that it is, the fact that it is uh, more expensive means that we're not gonna use the whole, you know, couple of hundred microns of, of Ionoma. That's not gonna happen. So it's a specialty material gets used for that layer to do that job. Um, you know, and probably one of the things that changes the more transparent EVAs that have come, maybe combined with the metal, maybe that's part of the problem behind these, uh, snail trails, these other mechanisms, like all these bill of materials constantly changing. And um, our accelerated aging tests don't necessarily see all these little problems or whatever, but uh, uh, Ionoma is more transparent, uh, but EVAs are fairly transparent, don't absorb all too much. It's, it's a, certainly a hit over time, a little bit of yellowing and UV absorption, but um, yeah, the introduction of the Ionoma is not gonna, not, gonna, not gonna change that. Yeah. Thanks very much, Daniel, that was great. Um, you showed a photoluminescence image with a, of a module um, or a cell. Of a cell with yeah. different spacing of your fingers. Yeah. Just uh, they're all the same spacing. Oh, different. Okay, why didn't you try imaging from the back? If you can replace There's it. aluminum all over, aluminum, sorry, aluminium. There's aluminium all over the back. That's my American <laughs> accent coming out, sorry. There's, we've got, um, it's a, it's, a, it's a good idea, yeah. So you could, um, our, Malcolm built this PL system and it's very good, but it's not quite as perfect as the quantitative systems that, that are out there, like the BT system or something. So you could get kind of a relative metric of voltage loss from something like that, but uh, we wouldn't be able to quantify the, the J0 quite the same way. So um, in this case, we've got an aluminum BSF all over the back here. So you can't image from the back. We just measure voltages from the front but it would be a handy mechanism, a handy trick to do if you could do a very quick analysis like that. This is, you know, 20 something measurements on one wafer. It takes us several minutes to measure it. I'd like it if it could be this quick and that easy. Sun's VOC test is easy, accessible for everybody and, you know, does all the fitting for us too. Anybody else? Yeah. Like if you have glass glass modules, would that reduce the snail, the snail trail? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that would. That would, and that's an emerging thing too, And also no right? PID, yeah. yeah. No PID? Mm. Because there's no frame, you mean? Or, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so the frame is grounded, so that's another thing. So, yeah, that's, that's coming. I think glass glasses seems to be coming. It's getting more popular with time, but uh, the standard architecture isn't that yet. Not yet. Malcolm. What's the adhesion of those uh, silver fingers as you start to bring them down to 20 microns wide? Is that becoming a problem for screw printing or is that still no problem? Not, not yet. 
Not yet. I think uh, they have a picture of some fingers here. The fingers still, in general, are not at a one-to-one -one aspect ratio. They've got a nice, they've got a nice contact area on the on the substrate. Um, they're not that tall. They're, they're, and they're still sort of porous, right? They still have some space to relax stress. Um, so we don't see delamination of fingers and things like this at this kind of aspect ratio. But uh, you start to print a finger on a finger or start to get really tall. That's where that could come into that could come into play. There's a lot of additives in here that work just for adhesion. You know, adhesion for bus bars for tabbing ribbons. Um, and the same thing should be working on the fingers. But it's something that I'm interested in looking more at. Actually, it's going to be a problem if you get really high aspect ratios. That material is going to pull off there. Yeah, it's something we're gonna. It's something we're gonna have to start looking at. Have you spoken to the group in here? I'm speaking later this afternoon. Yeah, yeah. No, it's very interesting. If there's if there's nothing, okay, go. <laughs> uh, related to that one, I was just reminded of another question that came up before. Um, you looked at all the. You had your pie chart of all the different failure modes in modules. Yeah, from and the visual like, inspections. Yeah. I was a little bit surprised that there was there's no um, disconnect. Interconnects between cells went there, so it's only coming in under. They're hard to see. They're hard to see, so they didn't come. That that that, that would probably fall in here, right? The metallization part of the cell or something, but. Corrosion. Yeah, yeah. This would be corrosion. All kinds of problems would come into there, but the ribbons are usually in place. But you know, EL can see when they're disconnected or something like that. You can see some problems, but yeah. So that's all. That's all. I know we're near the end of the time now, so I just wanted to say, you know, we've got a couple of UNSW alumni at our, at our site there. We've got Joe Scardera and Mason Terry still working. I'm there. Uh, DuPont has good respect for, for UNSW. Any of you are coming through the area, you feel free to come and visit or maybe give a seminar or we'll give you a lab tour or I don't know what. There's people always passing through the USA to give seminars or go to conferences. So um, get in touch with me. I've got a few business cards up here or you could reach me through, through Ziv. He has all my contact details. So. Yeah, feel free to stay in touch, everybody. Let's thank uh, Daniel again. If you want, he will stay later for the BOS. Yeah, I'll be at the BOS meeting.